and welcome to The Last Standee, a board game podcast coming to you from a trio of thrilling countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alessio. Hello. And Alexis. From Belgium. Bonjour. And I'm your host, Fen. Uh, today we're going to be talking about solo games, a whole load of solo games, and then a couple of them in specific, Warp's Edge and Spire's End Hildegard. But... Uh, before any of that, it's time for the last dandy catch-up. Uh, so, what's been up with you, Alessio? I hear you might be awaiting a delivery. Uh, yeah, actually, we are uh, at the moment of recording this uh, episode. I am exactly waiting for Aeon Trespasso DC to deliver. So, uh, FedEx wrote me a short message service that uh, they were delivering... Uh, kind in the next uh, half an hour so i'm waiting for them if you hear me run away from the mic uh, you know that i'm receiving a, a big package <laughs> so th- that's basically it um, i played quite a lot of spires and Hildegard uh, aside from that and uh, i think that's it i i since uh, we talked about War Chest in the past, uh, I revamped uh, my passion for the game. So I, I was playing on War Chest Online uh, f- like crazy for the last five or six days. That game is simply beautiful. And uh, uh, what about uh, you, Alexis? Well, uh, that is my name, indeed. <laughs> That's you! Uh, I have been doing uh, pretty great. Uh, I've played a couple of games uh, in the past week, uh, specifically in preparation for the um, 2022 uh, roundup of the top uh, 200 solo games in Tint at the next topic. Uh, and I've also played a fun little solo game a few times, uh, but that I will talk about later in the episode. Um, other than that, uh, not too much to uh, to celebrate, except that I recently sold my uh, to a publishing company my first uh, RPG module. Uh, it's it's a it's a tiny little thing, but it still sold like a hundred uh, um, copies of it. So I am pretty stoked about that. Should be proud. Yeah, I am, uh, and I hope that this is going to motivate me to uh, actually work more onto that and stop procrastinate. Uh, which is what's most important. Um, on the uh, on the next thing, uh, how are you doing, Finn? I'm doing very well, thank you. Um, I have been spending my time sorting out my Arkham Horror because Scarlet Keys arrived a while ago. We haven't finished Edge of the Earth yet. We got one or two scenarios left, but we've been setting up characters for that and going through. And because the Scarlet Keys is like this big old capstone to, I think, MJ, uh, MJ's career designing as they're stepping down. Um, I, I, I've noticed that it has like loads of the side mini scenarios jammed into it. So we've been getting them ready as well. Yeah, also the booklet for Scarlet Keys is enormous. Yeah, yeah, it's the it, it, edge of the earth was their transitional thing that they were doing, and this one now seems to be the full blown. Here's what we're doing. This is this big global campaign, Wiggly Doodad. Um, you got a little map that you uh, you tour around, and you go to different locations, and it's got like side story locations that you can. That go sounds to. very fun. Yeah, it it is. Uh, also, um, we played. Uh, the what is it the the blob that consumed everything um, side of a uh, story just to like earlier this week for a bit of um, fun because multiple people couldn't make it to role playing and uh, I'm very impressed it's it's not something I think that you're gonna replay lots and lots and lots um, but it was it's it's very fun uh, it's very much this is the blob the movie. Um, and off you go, try and survive as it like eats everything up. Um, so, yeah, it's it's not, I wouldn't call it top tier. It doesn't have the replayability of uh, Murder, but it is, it's definitely good. And I hope it's somewhere 
in the Scarlet Keys campaign, but it might not be because there's only Arkham as a location, and this takes place in Blackwater, which is, if I remember correctly, near Arkham. Um, so, yeah. Uh, apart from that, uh, I re have been playing a board game that Ale uh, Alexis and I are going to talk about in the future to yeah. um, to confirm that it's going to happen and lock us into doing it because the task is mammoth. But it's called Heart of Darkness by Kim Kanger. And it's a interesting game, uh, with which I have a lot to say about. A lot of baggage coming uh, alongside <laughs> it. Uh, a a lot of baggage. You don't get to name your board game Heart of Darkness without hundreds of years of baggage um, and fascinating yeah. stuff. So expect that sometime in twenty twenty three. I, this is the first board game that I had to read a book uh, to prepare myself for. Yes, you read a book. I've watched multiple documentaries on different people. Um, well, I, I, I had watched some of uh, some documentaries where I read some other books about the topic, but I never read the actual um, Conrad novel. So, yeah. Out of Darkness, uh, yeah. so far, interesting read. It is. Uh, it is. It's an yeah. interesting read indeed. Um, but we'll be um, talking about that That will be for future. later. Yeah, not, not now, sometime next year. And I chose Alexis because uh, the British Empire and Belgium. and Belgium have their dirty fingers in this all over the place. Uh, yeah so we'll get to that um yeah beyond that dark tide has just recently landed uh it's unstable as heck but mechanically that's, really good yeah it's the new vermin tide from fat shark um that's what i've been i've been hearing uh, i kind of wanted to play but i tried the the the, the beta that they had mm -hmm. for a little while and the game was like not running smoothly enough for me to spend uh, 40 euros in it, but I probably I'm going to pick it up at some point yeah. later. And the things to note is, first of all, you do need a good graphics card to run it. That's like the biggest thing. And if you don't have a good graphics card, lock your frame rate to 30 yeah. or 60. Um, well, because some of the I, environments I, you walk out in and just the particle effects tank everything and the flames are like, bye-bye fl bye -bye frames, just drop them all. And there's uh, two enemies that make flames on a regular occurrence so uh i recently st sold uh that uh, that module so i'm definitely p thinking about uh putting that money towards a new graphic card mm. uh, something that is more recent than my current one yeah well i mean the bottom uh, falling out of the crypto market ooh surprise uh is starting yeah. to free up graphics cards for the the plebeians like us so yeah that's nice um and uh oh yes so we also we're redoing the second office and we had an electrician in this morning because there's some weird plugs like halfway up the wall that the owner of the previous owner of the house who built this house put in so we had um the electrician come and check it all out and he because the wiring's a bit weird and everything he managed to electrocute himself while putting um <laughs> i'm sorry the, about the light that. back up <laughs> Yeah. And uh, sorry, to, sorry to laugh at this. No, no, no. He's fine. Yeah. He's he's fine. It was not a major shock, you know. He and he's he's a professional, um, but he wasn't expecting the wiring to be a bit weird in the light fitting, and so he dropped our uh, our light and broke every single one of the glass shades on it. So we got to buy a new light. Um, <laughs> That's a relief. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's <laughs> he was here earlier this week, and I was doing a load of cloud based work. Um, and he just turned the internet off without checking. So I lost two hours worth of work that I've had to oh, yeah. re-upload. Um, we had, and it's part of the reason we had to cancel our role playing is because I was in the process also of rebuilding the table at the same time. So that was a fun afternoon. So, you know, I'm not saying he deserved to get electrocuted. No one deserves to get electrocuted, but... The, but but yeah. sometimes you have a dog and you you zap them using a shock collar. This is kind of the no. The you thing. don't zap a dog using a shock collar you don't. ever. You don't do that. Prong <laughs> collars, no, no, no. Like if your dog has behavior problems, you train them. If you can't fully train them, you keep them under control, and don't put them in situations that they can't handle. That's yeah. You don't electrocute animals. Uh, I mean, I understand electric fences for livestock. Um, to keep them from wandering, but you know that's not you, you're still not electrocuting them. They're kind of electrocuting themselves, you know. Anyway, that's not enough about electrocuting animals. 
We've already an talked electrician. about horrible stuff. And an electrician, yes. A, a 80-year-old electrician. <laughs> so, oh, no. Yeah. It went dark fast, yes. Yeah, yeah. So no, no, that's that's a lot of what's been going on. Um, I also received a couple of other games. Of note, Carnival Zombie 2nd Edition finally arrived, uh, which is a bit cool. Um, and I don't know if I talked about it previously, but Agents of Schmirsch made it here. And if you like uh, Tales of Arabian Nights, uh, that's what it is, but with spies and a tighter mechanical oh. system. It's it's very fun. It's from Everything Epic, who did the amazing Big Trouble in Little China board game that you can't get unless you're willing to spend far too much money on the secondary market. Licensed board games, eh? Always good how they have limited print runs and you can't get them. Eh. Anyway, so Jack Burton's rather hard to find, but Agents of Smirsh is not, and I'm going to give it a recommendation. Oh. And that's enough, because I always talk a lot, because I, <laughs> I use the, the catch-up to also do mini-reviews on games that I'm like, I don't know if I have time to review this properly, but I need to talk about it. Um, so, Boom. That's that's me, and it's going to be me again, because we're now going to go to the One Player Girl Guild's uh, 2022 Top 200 Games. Yeah, so, the solo standee is back. Yes, the solo standee, shorter this time. Not going to dive into everything in a lot of detail, um, partly because you'll be talking about repeat games, but also... Uh, because we don't have time. We've got other solo games to talk about. We've got this one. And we've got this one. Oh. Yeah. So, um, don't I treat my board games really well? Yeah, don't, don't treat that box that well. Hey, you just don't no. know which box it is. It's that one. There's two boxes. Yeah. Anyway, um, so... This is the ninth year the One Player Guild has done their People's Choice Top 200 Solo Games. A few interesting facts to, and bits of data that they put on there. 998 people voted this year. That means we should probably go over 1,000 for the 10th anniversary next year. Uh, there was 1,499 unique games and a total of 17,644 votes because obviously people can vote for multiple different games. Um, so, uh, to get into it, I'm not going to walk through the whole list. It is on Board Game Geek. Uh, maybe we'll get a link in the description. Who knows? I'm not the one who does that. I'd like where you can work for other people, though. Um, uh, so, there are two new entries, like new this year, that made it into the list. I know both of you looked. Did either of you catch which those games were? Into the top 100, this is, like, the highest placed one. Uh, I've only... It, two games that made it to the top uh, to the They're top 25? They're both kickstart... No, top 100. So oh, top the, 100, the, I didn't look two, through the whole top yeah, yeah, 100. No, these are the two highest placed new 2022 solo games. Because Cult of the New doesn't cut into solo gaming, even though people complain about Cult of the New everywhere. Um, in solo gaming, it doesn't really happen. Yeah. So they're both Kickstarters, I... and if you didn't see them, you both know one of them. Yeah, I mean, two of us have played one of them. Uh, is it... Um, uh, ah, uh, Isle of God. No, um, what's the name of it? A, uh, a new entry from 2022. It's on Kickstarter again right now as well, or what just finished oh, recently. Oh, Oathsworn. Yep, so yeah, Oathsworn ah, is Oathsworn. the highest placed... New entry, uh, oh. and it is. Uh, I'm doing these in the opposite order. It made it to 83. I'm. I think it's going to be in the top hundred again next year because the yeah. second Kickstarter will bring the game to a lot more solo players. It, I'm not sure beyond isn't... that because I, I I've played through the campaign three times now, and I've used the encounter mode twice, which is what I think you do. Is it's more engaging after your first playthrough because you kind of solved the narrative puzzles already. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if I'm going to, unlike other boss battlers, want to reiterate on it repeatedly. I've played with like three different Oathsworn groups and uh, I think short of them releasing more Oathsworn, for me at least, I, I, it's, I'm done for now. 
So maybe it will fall off a bit, but it's genuinely a very good game to play solo, and it's it's a still a firm nine out of ten recommendation from me. Yeah. Isn't uh, Ark Nova uh, brand new from no, this year? No, it's 2021, but that was... Uh, oh, last year. Yes, last year. Uh, no, the oh. other one is from Chip Theory Games, and it's Burn Cycle, which... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've heard mixed things on, but it seems to be holding fairly well. Like, Shut Up and Sit Down didn't talk great about it, um, but they have uh, specific tastes as well when it comes to games, so it's got an 8.2. My issue is... I've got two chip theory solo games already. I've got too many bones. I've got Clouds yeah, and Aspire. I I really like a uh, chip theory, but I have sort of the same ish issues that crop with every one of their games. So I don't think that I will uh, keep buying them because yeah. I I the, while the the themes and the enjoyments are are different with every game, always it's the same frustration that comes back up. So mm. yeah, to, to be honest, um, the I think that Twenty Strong could be a very good game. It but, could be the aiming at the solo market. So. But but we can wait. Yeah, but we can wait for the game mm. to be yeah. out and check. Set. Yes. I gotta say, um, I liked Twenty Strong breaking their usual model because Burn Cycle. I'm looking at it. I'm like, well, thematically, it's something I'm kind of interested in taking a team of robots and like, you know, yeah. breaking in against a corporation and all this kind of stuff. That's cool. But it's another one of their big heavy boxes with all their mats and chips and everything. And I'm like, well, I have Cloudspire, all of Cloudspire. I have too many bones, all of too many bones, apart from their Black Friday release, because I'm not buying limited time releases. I think that's a crappy way to do things. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, I, I'm now burn notices back on my radar and I'm like, no, 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 no. But uh, yes, but no. So that's the two highest placed new ones. And now we're just going to get into the top 25. So I gave the guys uh, a quick little um, look at the list. And they're going to take a guess. Because at the start of this year, I said to myself, I was like, I'm going to try and guess what the top 25 um, solo games for this year are going to be. And I'm going to try and play all of them. Um, so... An audience, you can have a guess before we start moving through the list. Uh, Alexis, how many out of from zero to 25 do you think I managed to play? You probably played, I'm going to put my guess on 23, uh, but that's only a conservative guess because I think that it's probably going to be 24, but uh, 23 is my guess. Okay, 23. And Alessio? Uh, yes, I actually uh, think the same, meaning that uh, it's actually. I guess 24, but there's one. I know you have the other variant, so I'd say 23. Okay, cool. So 23 is the uh, the educated guess from the pundits, and you guys may have your own out there. Uh, so let's start wandering through them. I'm not going to go into these games in a lot of detail, because that's not what this is about, but I will have some comments, and maybe we will also. You know, everyone have, may have comments. Uh, number 25 is Cartographers. Yes, you know I've played it. I've talked about it on the podcast in the Roll and Write episode. It's my most played Roll and Write. Yeah, it helps that it's really good on the phone as well. Yeah. I like the phone app. So I've played it a lot. And it's it's as good as ever. Nemo's War is the next one, second edition. Um, and you both know I've played that. And I love yeah, that. Yeah. And and I really like it. I, did we ever talk about Nemo's War on, uh, yeah. on the podcast? Yes. Yeah, you talked about okay. it. You did. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> yes, you did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's fantastic. I it's a great skipped game. out on the Legendary Edition or whatever they're doing because um, after Everdale, you know, I'm like, do I really need a new edition of a game I already have? So I'm 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 being more restrained on things like that. But yeah, Nemo's War, love it. Uh, Nusford is number twenty three. Which yep. we all know I've played. I've talked about yep. it. Yep. Um, and Lost Ruins of Arnak, which we know I'm not a huge fan of, but uh, I have played. But you played it? Yep, yep. I played it. Uh, I, I like the solo campaign more as an experience, but I still think that the game is too physically large for what it does and takes a little bit too long to get through. Yeah. Yeah, the campaign's la better. La luckily, Adrian's World I'm planning to buy. La luckily, the, the, the higher contender is uh, higher on the list. 
<laughs> yeah. Ah. Uh, Hadrian's Wall, talked about it, love it. Got a campaign yep. as well. Yeah. Recommended enough that I, I want to buy it. Yeah, a thorough recommendation for me. Um, my favourite role on right I have played this year that was new to me, uh, Sprawlopolis. You didn't play it. I have played it. I oh, have okay. it. I have it so much that I gifted a second copy of it to one of my friends when he visited because oh. I realised I had it twice. No, I got Sprawlopolis. I love Sprawlopolis. I so love it, it. So it's 24 or 25. Mm. Yeah, it might yeah. be. It might not. Who knows? There's some tough we'll ones near the top. Um, then there's Wingspan. We know you played it. We Everybody know. played it. Yep, I've, yeah. I've mostly played the European version now. Um, but yeah. it's, it's been on that list for, for years, Wingspan too, right? Uh, four uh, years in the top 100. Four yeah. years. Yeah, it, yeah, um, but yeah it, it's... It deserves its place. Yeah, it's also very high in the in the top BGG top fifty played every month. So uh, it's yeah. either first, first or uh, second, third in the top five anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's sitting still. At, I think rank nineteen on Board Game Geek, so it's it's holding up. But that's of course not just a solo; that's the whole thing. The Automata is just very good. I do love a bit of old tomato, so it does a good job. Uh, Obsession, yeah. which yep. is still in contention we, for my game of the year. We played, really, mm. really fun. Fantastic. It's such a great, even solo, it's full of stories and emerging yeah. storytelling and bits and pieces. It's fantastic. Uh, then number 17 is Scythe, yeah. which, uh, you... of course, I've played. I've talked about yeah. on the podcast. I own multiple multiple automata decks, so I can play against multiple automata when I'm in the mood for something really crunchy and I want to play through the Rise of Fenris campaign again. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of Stonemaier Games games on the whole, but Scythe is one of their best. Yeah, I, I, I'm not thinking that Scythe is one of their best, like we talked about uh, when we talked about Scythe, but uh, yes, I... I share the thoughts. Uh, yeah. yeah, a lot of people really like it. Mm, yeah, yeah, it's it's nice to play a a war themed game that is more about the logistics and economy of war. Yeah, yeah. Uh, number sixteen is a feast for Odin. Yeah, I will. That I'm. Yeah. I wasn't sure if you played. I it. have. I've talked about it on the podcast. <laughs> I ha I will only oh. play it with Norwegian's expansion, um, which is a big ask to get. Like have to buy a game and buy an expansion, but that's because the base game is too, is too limited. Because you're you're very sandboxy in what you choose to do. So hmm. it took the Norwegians expansion to give us enough options to vary your decisions. It's great though. It's a very good game. Yeah, I think Uwe Rosenberg's best. Uh, yeah, I like Nusford more because Nusford's faster to set up and tear down, and um, that's true. Yeah. But also, both of these games are generous, which is when Rosenberg's at his best. His designs are best when they're giving you lots of options and lots of things to do, as opposed to Agricola, which is like mean as heck and has the random mystery of, why can only one family have a child this year? <laughs> and and wait, wait, wait to starve. Uh, starving's fine. Starving's fine. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Um, Number 15 is Robinson Crusoe Adventures on Cursed Island. I, We've talked about it. I really it. like it. Yeah. I love but it. I, I like it more as a, as a cooperative game yeah. than as a solo game. Um, some of the scenarios are really good solo, uh, especially the high difficulty ones. But yeah, the most fun occurs in the shared misery. Definitely. <laughs> uh, number 14 is Under Falling Skies. Alex which... covered that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Which I, uh, yep, yeah, I've played. I own. Uh, I preferred it once I got outside of the campaign mode and just play like random scenarios. Campaign mode felt limiting, so uh, still a very good solo game for the size of the box and the price. Then we have one of my favourite games I've played this year, Dune Imperium. Absolutely agree. Yeah. Yep, brilliant game, really enjoyable. Brilliant expansions. I can only speak for one expansion. So far. Yeah, yeah. Immortality is out on its way, but it looks like it's very beautiful. It uh, the only complaint I have with Immortality is that uh, is going to get the the Tleilaxu in the game before they actually appeared. 
honestly, like beyond the first book, no one should care about the law because it's <laughs> it's a, it's a sheer drop off. Once you finish the first book, the quality just tanks into a valley. Uh, so, no, I love the, the second book. It's mm. uh, after the fourth book where the quality begins to drop. Yeah, with the God Emperor in English of Dune. Um. Yeah. Well, you know, when he becomes a giant worm, that's. Uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, right. Number twelve is Imperium Classics. Uh, we've not uh, talked about this on the podcast, uh, but it's a very crunchy solo game. Um, this is, uh, in my opinion, the less good of the two, but oh, it's still good. Yeah, I I saw that I have Imperium Classics and you have Imperium Legends. I, I have both. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you got you played twenty five of them. Then this this was the other. I, I thought you had only the other version. Uh, yeah. Well, no, because Gaia Project. I hate um, Terra Mystica, um, and so I've never gotten around to playing Gaia Project because it's Terra Mystica in space oh. and it's expensive. So this is the first game I've not played at number eleven. Is Gaia Project? I've heard great things about it, especially solo. But I bounced so hard off Terra Mystica, and I got it when it first came out in German. Um, and I was really happy to sling that copy away as fast as possible for the price I paid. Yeah. So it's not not for me. Um, it, yeah. Is it? Uh, do, do you know if it's as crunchy as uh, Terra Mystica? It, it's apparently very crunchy, and yeah, um, it, it's even worse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not for me then. It, it's uh, Settlers of Catan on steroids in space. <laughs> yeah um so that's the first no so max possible now is 24 um then arc nova um yep. which i that. i have i played it's right next to me here in on my shelf of i keep these things downstairs um that one looked beautiful i was thinking about grabbing it at some point it it is it's uh it genu- genuinely has an animal terraforming mars feel to it um it is a fairly good game. The main complaint it aimed at it, and I level this complaint as well, is that the draw deck is far too large, and they really could have done with curated draw decks with like set lists of hey, these have this icon, play with these, or play with these to have different flavors of zoos, or if you want, just chuck everything in together. Um, Terra, uh, sorry, uh, Terraforming Mars works really well with the big draw deck because of how much else you're doing elsewhere, especially with Prelude involved. Arc Nova, sometimes you just, you can't do anything. You can't get going because you don't have the cards to get you going. You could have a, uh, as famously commented, you could have a big pile of bears that all want you to have bears in your zoo before you can play the bears, and you don't have a bear that doesn't mind there are Nova bears around, so your bear strategy bears no points. Yeah, ah. yeah, I'd say that uh, while Terraforming Mars is a lot long to play, uh, Terraforming Mars will still uh, came out, come out on top because uh, the first half of the game in Arc Nova you are just playing randomly hoping that uh, you will have enough of an engine to carry on a strategy in the last part of the game. Or at least that's how we played it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, if you get super into just being all right with whatever randomly lands at your feet is what you're going to go with, which works very well in the solo version, then uh, it holds up. And I do I do really like it. I like the constructing of the zoo with the hex grid that you're building your own personal zoo as opposed to terraforming a shared planet. So um, it yeah, just that... I feel like it needs an expansion to cut it down. They know how to make it interesting, yes. Yeah. Uh, then we have uh, Aeon's End. Uh, we played about nine. this twice. Yes. We have, we have. Yeah. Um, I'm counting it, but it is worth noting, I've not played original Aeon's End because it's always sold out whenever I try and find it. So I've only played the Legacy version, and I'm waiting for the Legacy of Graveholt to arrive, but I've played Aeon's End Legacy, which still counts in my opinion. It is a big favorite of the podcast. It's it's a great boss battler. It's yep. really yeah. enjoyable. Yeah. Easy um, to set up and it's on Steam. 
So yes. you can have it oh, for three dollars. You yeah. can. I, I, I do not I bounce off that Steam application. Are the noises I had to silence the whole damn thing because the noises were just making me feel physically ill. And I'm not <laughs> normally upset by noises, but they were just awful. Um but yeah, if you're happy with card game electronic card game implementations, um then you know it works well. Personally I like my electronic card games to be designed as electronic card games. Um so. yeah. But yeah, <coughs> Marvel Snap. The, tra- <coughs> the transition is not always uh, possible. Yeah. I mean, it's still it's pretty good. Um, but I mean, the best board game electronic thing I've still played is it remains um, a, a one deck dungeon. Which... And uh, cartographer. Yeah. Uh, yes, you're right. Cartographer. Um, yeah, cartographer is super easy as well. Although you miss out on cut, drawing your own trees. Number eight. Terraforming Mars. We talked about it. We know I've played it. We know I've got a very disappointing big box that has a bunch of empty spaces in it. Another classic, yeah. Yep. Uh, number seven, Lord of the Rings of Card Game. Uh, this, yes. Yep, I've got it. I've played it. I actually owned it when it first came out. And then um, that uh, set of copies was taken from me. And I got it again uh, this year. Um, yeah, it's got under the revisions from the, Yes, I, I was not going to, I'm not touching all their giant mis- mishmash different piles of stuff, but the new release model that matches the Arkham one is fantastic. Uh, and I like how it's, it's about building a deck for a given scenario or campaign. So you kind of have to retool and rebuild the decks when you change different scenarios. So it's a nice game for a deck builder. And I like building decks. You know, a person who likes building decks as opposed to a deck builder game. Uh, number six, Gloomhaven. We've talked a mystery, about that. A mystery. Yep. Why someone would set up this game alone and play it alone when set up is like one hour? Uh, no. <laughs> I have the Laser Ox insert. Setup is five, maybe ten minutes. Okay. It is. It is so hour. well done. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. Or, or or I could just run the electronic version, which you know is great as well. Yeah, no, the electronic version is the right version of that game. <laughs> uh, number five is too many bones. We know I've played that. We talked yep. about it on the podcast. Uh, number four is Arkham Horror: The Card Game, which I mean, of course, I've not played. You probably <laughs> Yeah, I played that. Um, yeah, and we are going to play that tomorrow. Yep, yeah, we are. We are. We're going to play Dunwich tomorrow. I'm going to um, play with uh, Alexis and my partner, and um, Leo as well is going to join us. This is his first time playing. Um, so I've given him Mark Harrigan with the big gun go boom, boom, pew, pew. Um, and he's very uh, happy because he thinks Mark Harrigan's a very handsome man, and that's what he wanted was a handsome man to play as. So. Oh. Yeah. Um, and uh, then number three is Marvel Champions, a card game. Oh, all all three of these fantasy flight card game, living card games are just really good to play solo. What can you do? Yeah, yeah. Th- this uh, is uh, probably it's right the placement because Marvel Champions is probably the easiest to play in scenarios so for solo. Um, yeah, it's the easiest to just uh, pick up and play and put down again. Um, the campaigns do not hold together as well, and I think yeah. if you're looking for a longer play experience, which some solo players enjoy, like myself, uh, Arkham Horror for me would be ahead of Marvel Champions. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, it's it's very, very good. Um, then we have at number two, my personal number one, Mage Knight, <laughs> uh, specifically the Ultimate Edition. Um, yeah. yeah, always a big, uh, a big classic too. Yeah. Uh, I think that it's been, uh, uh, yeah. I'm just checking here, uh, ranked number two for uh, at least three years. It's been in the top hundred for nine years. The whole time yeah. the list has been around, it's always in the conversation for good reason because it is a long and lengthy game with a lot of decisions. But by the end of it, it's super interesting, and you know, it is actually a deck builder, which is kind of fun to realize yeah. that that's what it is. And number one is, I believe, the same as last year and the year before. Yeah. It's no surprise to anyone, it's Spirit Island. Yeah. I still have not played that one. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 no surprise, but still, this is the king of cooperative games. 
so weird that is in a solo list uh, it goes no not at all it's but, it's yeah. amazing solo as well you can play like one spirit and try and handle how one spirit operates on one board or you can play two-handed with double spirits and yeah. then you get to p play the combos back and forth because quite often when you play cooperative in spirit island you don't get to mesh with other players too much because everyone's very much on their own board and newer players as well in particular can get very fixated and focused on just their board so you end up playing multiplayer solo um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's surprisingly then if you play two-handed solo you tend to uh, cooperate and coordinate the spirits a lot tighter perfectly yes <laughs> yeah well not perfectly but anyway and given the whole diff range of like sliding difficulties you can play this game on with simple spirits complex spirits adversaries uh, branch and claw and everything there's no surprise it's got so many options and a big important thing for a solo game in my opinion is smart scaling so if you yeah. want to play really difficult you can uh, arkham and marvel both are the same thing you can slide the difficulty up if you want to although arkham distorts when you play at the highest difficulty and you play characters who just don't draw from the bag because drawing from the bag's really bad so you just yeah. do everything testless as they call it um <laughs> Uh, but it's it's you know fantastic and it's a big big thing that makes the game enjoyable. So that's this year's solo list. That's my short opinions on each and every entry. I played twenty four out of twenty five. I knew it. Mm -hmm. I should have. Yeah. Yeah. I was too conservative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You 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 said twenty four, but you settled on twenty three. Uh, still, you know, it's it's a good 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 guess. I am. Um, if I'm gonna beat that next year, I'm gonna have to play Gaia Project um, because there's no way it's not gonna be in the list because it's like yeah, it seems like it's going to be a, a keeper. Yeah. The only one that might drop out is probably Cartographer replaced by whatever is uh like uh because it it's uh yeah, just checking. It was a 33 last year. Yeah. I think that if there's like a couple of more. Uh, better contender cartographer might drop yeah uh, yeah the the big thing for cartographers don't. i think it did just cling its way in but it is how light and easy it is to play and how much you do end up being able to play it like you can easily knock out three four games and still be like oh well i wouldn't mind one more um but yeah, yeah. i wouldn't be surprised to see it fall out there i kind of think nisford has a chance of falling out because it's just difficult for people to get so it has it it has been sliding a little bit. That is possible, yeah. yeah. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see. Like the big climber, Hadrian's Wall had a big storm up the t towards the top. Like really moved hard. Uh, went from fifty to twenty one, which is, you know, a big big jump. Word of mouth is fantastic for games like solo get players seem to be. This game comes out and then some people play it solo and then talk about it and go, yeah, this is a good solo recommendation for these reasons. And then it picks up steam like Dune Imperium from 23 to 13. Another mm -hmm. big jump in. And Ark Nova went from 1,025 to one uh, to 10. <laughs> yeah, when people like... But it was difficult to get in 2021, so... Yeah, it, it, got, it. it got also localized distributions which helped yeah, but the Ark Nova was the biggest jump up and in, um, and I'll be interested to see where that is next year. So, uh, with all of that done, we are going to stick on this list, but we're not going to talk about every game, because I think we're going to be talking about it. It's somewhere in the 50s, I think, maybe. And yeah. that is Warp's Edge. So, Alexis, would you uh, like to strap in and uh, prepare for the waves as you tell us all about this? Uh, engage hyperdrive, um, Mr. Spock. <laughs> I don't so, think Mr. Uh, Spock plays Space Invaders. No, probably not. <laughs> yeah. So, Warp's Edge reminded me a lot. It's a game that you recommended to me, uh, Fen. And it reminded me a lot of these Deep Space uh, D6, but as a slightly more complicated and with a drafting mechanic instead of just rolling die, yeah. uh, dices. I was out by uh, 10, it was 44. Oh, uh, it is a very fun, uh, strictly solo uh, deck building game. But instead of building a deck, you build a bag of uh, tokens that you're going to use to uh, power your move. So basically, um, 
in this game, you play as a lone uh, stealth fighter fighting an invasion of enemies that come in. And uh, behind those enemies, there's a big bad guy that you need to defeat. Uh, each bad guy is going to have like slightly different modifiers that are, are going to be. It's like a big space station. Um, and to destroy them, you are going to need to play around those modifiers. They act a little bit like bosses. It reminded me a little bit of uh, Eon's End in that regard. Um, and the game is very fun. Uh, you have a bunch of different starfighters that you can use to, to fight that will each have their different um, uh, dice pool in the bag uh, for what move you can do. And uh, some of them will have uh, more health or more shield or will be able to perform certain feats. Uh, alongside that, uh, you will have a couple of traits. I think that you get one uh, new trait at the start of every round. So those traits will modify the way that you play. Uh, some of them are just passive. Uh, over, you can use them multiple times by paying a, a specific cost. And they can be very powerful, like uh, interrupting all damage for one given turn, which means that you can uh, focus only on attacking. Um, the way that you play the game is that you're going to draw those tokens and uh, put those, uh, use those tokens to perform different actions. So it can be dodging, shooting, uh, uh, recharging your shields. Uh, what's interesting is that whenever you defeat an enemy, either by dodging it or uh, destroying it, you're going to get a different reward. So uh, for dodging, usually you're going to get more energies that can power up uh, some of your, your moves. If you destroy them by attacking, you might get some more um, attacking behavior, uh, so some more, some more powerful lasers. Uh, the whole point of the game is that you kind of have to build your... Uh, build your bag i was going to say build your deck but that doesn't really apply here uh, build your bag so that you can get a more powerful arsenal and uh, destroy the the big enemy uh, and make sure that you don't get overwhelmed because every enemy that you don't interact with is going to attack at the end of the, the round the game is very simple to learn um, i made a pro job at explaining it but the rule book uh, explains it in maybe 10 minutes of reading uh, and then it's on to the game, which is very fun. Uh, I, don't, I, I really enjoyed myself with it. I, I thought that the first uh, boss that, that the game uh, puts against you uh, is a bit of a, a mean one, because you can only attack it if you completely destroyed every uh, other uh, small ship uh, in front of you. So you need to build a very aggressive and very fast deck. Uh, and I found I actually had a better time fighting the, the second one. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for the recommendation, Fen. Uh, how did you like it yourself? Well, um, I liked it so much that I went out to get myself some coin capsules because uh, from having played Arkham Horror quite a bit, I can tell you any time you play a bag builder that involves tokens, uh, cardboard tokens, you need to do something to protect them, otherwise they get shredded. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, surprise. the tokens meant that it wouldn't fit into the box properly, so I abandoned that, and I'm back to thinking about what to do with other tokens, uh, you know, coin capsule token holders, I should say. Um, yep. So that's my my like how much I really enjoyed it. I I love a bag builder. Uh, I'm going to provide a quick recommendation for another bag builder, um, which is Orleans. It's a Euro bag builder. I'm not sure on availability right now because I think it was with Tasty Minstrel, Minstrel Games and something happened to them. Um, they went under or something. So there's a DLP edition. Anyway. Uh, Is it me or are you always looking for a way to quickly recommend a game because you never have enough time to uh, talk about all of them? I've got 700 games. Maybe 800. I've lost count. So yes, I play a lot of games and I don't have a lot of time to write about them because I spend so much time like testing and writing about Kingdom Death that like, <laughs> you know, I do 3,000 to 5,000 words on Kingdom Death a week and I can tell you like writing that much, it's that's a lot of time. So I don't get to write about the other board games I want to. So I shove them in. I'm like, what about this one and this one? So yeah, um... Anyway, before I get back to that, I just wanted to briefly say, when we talked about Spire's End, um, one of our listeners uh, chimed in today, in fact, so 
they know when we recorded this um, and said you might want to check out Ruin's Deathbinder, which uh, as soon oh. as I saw the name, it's been across my radar before. It's a one to two player reverse deck building dungeon crawling game. So you start, yeah, I've seen yeah, that pass by. It's it's very cool. Apparently, it's like not super easy to get your hands on, but it's not expensive when you do. Uh, it came out in twenty twenty one. It's from Heavy Punch Games. I assume they're talking about the tokens rather than um, violence, <laughs> but yeah. So I just wanted to chip that in and say we do read what you comment, and uh, this was a good one. I like this. I'm going to see if I can try and find it. It's a deck thinning game. Mm, my favorite kind. Anyway, yeah. Warp's Edge. Uh, as I say, I love a good bag builder. I also love a good boss battler. This is both, and I really like the price. Yeah. The... Oh, I did not check the price. It's uh... not an expensive game. That doesn't that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, it's a very very quick one. Probably like in the twenties, thirties. Uh, yeah. Um, it's between thirty to forty euros, depending whereabouts you get it okay. from. So yeah, it's uh, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Um, I, I I was just found a little bit underwhelmed by the fact that the the boss battling uh, aspect isn't too. Um, too present there's no ai deck or any way to like change the behavior of the enemies they're very like just going to do one thing uh, you compared it to um space invaders yeah. at the it's, it's uh, a, earlier and this is very it, much it, that well yeah, it, that's the thing is this is somebody looked at those 1980s more like probably 1990s shoot 'em ups like hang on i know the name it had the theme song was galacta no no the th- it was bomb the bass um xenon 2 yeah, that's the one. Um, I had I had a older friend who played Zen on two, and ah. I ve- I can cannot ever unforget the the theme, which is brilliant. But yeah, so scroll vertical scrolling shoot maps is what it made me think of, where you like fight through waves and waves of of, of enemies, and then you get to fight a boss that acts in a fixed way, um, which I was okay with. That, that's the experience I was expecting. Um, I, I can't recommend it, but you might want to check out Bullet Heart um, for another shoot 'em up style experience. It's beautiful, Bullet Heart. I love Bullet Heart. It's beautiful, but Bullet Star is. Um, I, the artwork is a bit. Yeah, I'm not hmm. a weeb. Yeah. <laughs> well, beyond weeb, like weeb is okay. Yeah, anime is fine as an art style. It's when it's thirsty that's like. Yeah, problematic. Yeah. Um, so actually, I'm waiting for Bullet Heart to come into stock in my local stockist uh, from Level Ninety Nine Games, and I'm definitely gonna get and play that because it sounds right up my alley. But we're talking about Warp's Edge, and I keep darting yep. onto other things. Uh, so I, I do, I love the customization of you pick what boss you're fighting, you pick which ship you're playing. Um, all four yeah, ships the, are the, different. The different ships have all like a very different uh, style and, and yeah. feel when you play with them. I only played with three of them, mm-hmm. but uh, each time it really changed the way that I was approaching the game. One of them I was just like, dodging around every enemy, uh, not even like thinking about fighting them. Yeah, uh, very fun. Yeah, it's uh, I it like considering how quickly it plays, thirty to forty five minutes. Yeah, how uh, the the dashboard um, you played on Tabletop Simulator, yeah. Or something. Yeah. Yep. So the physical copy has a set of like plastic dashboards that you pull out and you rack up all of the relevant tokens that you're going to draw from. That's um, always so enjoyable. You can always see everything that you've got uh, and uh, and have a good look and you know what reserves are available of things you can draw. Um, I actually quite like as well the intentional thinning you can do. So where you can fight something and. You can be like, okay, I'll actually take this hit so I can get rid of that, like, yeah, that, that shit that's oh. not doing much for me at all. Although the the one thing, but maybe I need to to play it small to to better understand it. But you kind of want to have a bunch of token in your bag because once you get rid, once you're out of token, uh, 
you you wrap and you 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 wrap and yeah. the 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 turn the turn change. So you kind of want to have a certain amount of tokens. Yeah, you don't want uh, a super yeah. thin pile of tokens at all. That's not yeah. going to work, even if they're very very powerful, because you've got to kill a certain number of enemies in a certain number of actions. You've got to yeah yeah, especially like that first boss as you talked about. You, that one's great for training you on how to build your bag up for endurance and to get through everything. So um, that, that I found quite interesting. But yeah, it's it's nice when you're, you, you've you played it enough and you get to the corners and the edges of where you can be like, I don't need this one energy. I don't. I'm yeah. just going to take... And I don't want to get these tokens that are coming from beating this. So it's I'm just going to take that hit to my shields. That's fine. Uh, and I will like replenish that with some of the better stuff. Uh, it's generally energy I find myself cutting out. Uh, yeah, it, b- yeah, because energy is the, the currency that you use to buy a new token yeah, um, most of shields. the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah. you don't need it that much. Like you're going to take a couple of damage every now and then, but you don't you don't really need to be full of energy. Yeah. Uh, so that's one of those things I've really liked and I've been playing with a bit, and it's caused some like dramatic losses because it's I, I'm still refining to understand how to do that right. Uh, I also like the mixed the card powers you get at the start to even vary things up a little bit more. You know, each warp you get like a new extra power to lead into and use. That's fun. Uh, it's just light, it's easy, and uh, yeah, it's a, yeah. if you want to play a, a solo deck building game, this is a very a very fun one to just pick up and and play with. I think. Yeah. Bag builder. Yes, bag builder. Bag builder. It's, it, it's the same mechanic. It's it's almost the same mechanic, almost. But yeah, I, it, it would only be different if the the tokens had some um, texture to them that you can uh, shuffle around to to find the the right one. It would make a difference in uh, in terms of gameplay. There's a there's a physicality difference to it as well. It, that is like, true. I, I, I you play only play the electronic version, you damn Zuma. <laughs> uh, you're a millennial like me. That's nonsense. Um, you know, so uh, it's uh, it, it, physically. It, I I like deck builders more because I like shuffling, but I will say like bag builders, you chuck everything in, shake the bag, boom. Oh, that is fun. I, especially when you have uh, chunky tokens like any game by uh, Chip Theory that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that uh, uh, pocket chip uh, type feel is always oh, war very fun. Chest. War yeah, chest. war chests. War, chest. um, war chest. Great example. Very nice, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's, that's us done on Warp's Edge. That's a recommendation, yeah. Yeah, yep. uh, there, there was just one game that I am trying to remember the name of because it's escaping me right now. That is very similar to the to it. It's made by Panda, not Panda Soros, but uh, someone else, and I can't find the name of it. Mm. Well, if you uh, can remember, you can shout it out during the next section and interrupt. That's what I do. Uh, so yep. I just wanted to say that uh, Warp's Edge is by Renegade Games. Uh, it's designed by Scott Elms. I think Uh, there's also two expansions. There's one in 2020 and then there's one that's supposed to come out this year um, called Anomaly. Um, I haven't played either one. I haven't seen Virian Invasion anywhere that I could get it. But uh, yeah, so I'm going to I just say if you like the sound of this, you can't go wrong with it. And it's it's just nice to have a cheap game that has a lot of variety within it. Uh, so that takes us on away from space to a game that I don't believe made it onto the solo rankings this year because it dropped a little bit too late. Yeah. It'll probably be on there somewhere next year. So if you would like to tell us all about the life of using a catapult uh, <laughs> to deal with all your problems, then um, take it away, Alessio. Let's hear about Spire's End Hildegard. Yep. So, uh, Spires and Hildegard is a Kickstarter game uh, which dropped, uh, I think, uh, one month in November 2022 uh, to Bakers. The the game just came back to me. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Puzzle Strike. Uh, Very similar to Puzzle Strike uh, in terms of uh, the the, the gameplay and the the energy... um, 
uh, the energy mechanic. Unless uh, the only the big difference is that puzzle stri strike is um, uh, one on one, one v one game, um, and that it it has like a lot of uh, combos and a lot more depth in its mechanic. Uh, it's it would be uh, an amazing game if it wasn't for the horrible uh art that the game has but uh have you ever played it then no no i i've oh. no i've not been interested and a big part of that is any 1v1 competitive games are not going to get much play in this household yeah that makes sense oh but but, but please be my guest keep talking about puzzle strike uh, do you like puzzle yeah. strike, <laughs> no, uh, actually i never played puzzle strike so i don't know we can but, talk about it in the future then. Because we can talk about it another day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, the interruptions are meant to be short and sweet, and yes. you know, like that was just supposed to be a ah, length this is... of a text on a card. Um, so instead, let's let's get back to to Hildegard, shall we? She's yep. patiently waiting. Maybe her yes. sister's there as well. You know, with her let's boomerang. Who it. knows? Let's get on with it. Yeah, of course. In this game, you play Hildegard, which is. Uh... Okay, it is important to know probably that this is kind of a prequel to Spire's End, which is uh, the first game from Favreau Games, uh, the first game from Greg Favreau, the designer. And uh, uh, we actually reviewed it uh, in uh, written form on our Patreon, so uh, to get impressions and, uh, and thoughts about Spire's End. Uh, you can get to our Patreon. It is uh, free to read. If you want to become a Patreon, of course, uh, you're welcome. But uh, uh, that said, Spires and uh, Hildegard talks about Hildegard, uh, who is a, a community favorite character from Spires and. This happens years before the happenings in Spires and. I won't spoil them, possibly to you during this uh, during this review but uh, you will not spoil them i have still haven't decided if i'm going to try and chase a copy of spire's end or not you if you talk about it i'm not going to get it okay so i, I will not spoil them but uh, it's a card game designed for a solo or two players play it the gameplay flows like uh, uh, it flows in spire's end so you if you played with Spersend, you basically can expect to play these cards. It's a fun game because you have this single deck of cards. It occupies virtually no space uh, because you just have to put a few cards which represent your character and your equipment uh, uh, near you. After that is a single deck with a single discard pile at the center of the table and dice and tokens. And that's it. Uh, the game flows smoothly. It's a beautiful game in which you are Hildegard and you are uh, awakening one day to deliver a small package to the Baroness in... Uh, I, I, I don't remember the name of every place, but it's Secret Cliffs, most assuredly. So, uh, during this adventure, Hildegard uh, must travel from its original uh, its hometown in uh, Hickory Hills in uh, actually to be sure I it's not Hickory Hills the first place it's uh, I'm getting the cards it's Grey Oaks okay you travel through Hickory Hills then you go to the city of Crown's Nest and then you end it in Secret Cliffs uh, this is represented in the game by four different decks that you are encouraged to use one at a time so that you can use them at check as checkpoints if your adventure tracks too long. And it uh, is played by a very beautiful mechanic. Basically the cards are in order, you never shuffle them and uh, you begin by drawing first card and the, the card tells you a bit of a story and gives you the choices. When you go with the choices, you are given a card num number to draw or to pull. If you have to draw cards, you just advance your deck by discarding everything in the middle uh, until you get to the right number of the card. So uh, you basically have a very tidy, very ordered deck of cards in front of you and you have only one active card at a at time. Or you can pull cards you pull them out of order, sometimes you have to retard them 
to the deck after you're done. Sometimes you have to keep the cards you pull, but uh, in that case, you just take the cards without advancing the deck. And that's basically it. Uh, this is the game. You have sometimes confrontation. Uh, when you uh, happen to find something that you want to hunt, since, uh, like Fen said, Hildegard is armed with a, with a catapult, uh, so she can hunt, or uh, you have to uh, actually fight, so the difference is that the, the critters you hunt uh, don't fight back. It's uh, like Hildegard trying to eat something. Uh, in the case of uh, real combat, the, uh, the, the enemies you fight are fighting back. Uh, in that case, Hildegard can back them eight and can try to block. Anyway, this is done through a set of dice. Dice are special. They all have parts of a bullseye. Uh, so you ca can have half a target, half of another target. You can have just the bullseye of the target. Uh, you can have just the outside of the target. You can just have half of the outside of the target and so on. Uh, you can, uh, uh, every enemy, has a difficulty which is done by the accuracy required to kill it and the number of dice you can roll. Uh, you basically have to roll dice and refine them by re-rolling. You can re-rolling them with diminishing returns. So if you roll four dice, the next time you can you must keep at least one and then re-roll the next three dice and so on until you are left with no dice to re-roll. And you must compose uh, a bullseye out of uh, these uh, uh, dice results. When you hit the target number of dice within the number of sets you can roll, uh, you have actually uh, uh, succeeded in uh, your attack. So if it's a critter to hit, you score the one hit. If it's uh, an enemy, you actually wounded it. And when you get to the one total, you win. If uh, you cannot do uh, that in time for a critter, the critter escaped, you usually have a failure uh, card exit. And if it's an enemy, the enemy fights back and uh, you are getting it with a similar mechanic. The enemies require only uh, a specific symbol in a specific order, but they work basically the same. Uh, this mechanic is a bit different from what uh, it's an evolution of what you found in Inspired Sand. In Inspired Sand, you had uh, uh, regular dice to roll and you basically picked the result you wanted to activate some powers. And uh, it was fun to play, but this is funnier. Uh, there is also a will shot dice, which is uh, a wildcard modifier die. Uh, that you begin, uh, it has ranks, so it can uh, uh, increase in level, and you can choose from the wild shot pool uh, of dice you have, the one wild shot dice you will always throw, and uh, this is basically it. The, the combat is, uh, the system is very smart and works like a charm. Uh, you are basically adventuring uh, in this world, which is uh, a bit brighter than, but I, I, I will talk about this, it's a bit brighter than the world in Spire Sand, uh, and you have adventures there. Uh, you can play this game uh, by choosing your own adventure and uh, by fulfilling or not fulfilling some requirements in some combat or by taking items or not taking items. Every, uh, every choice is basically viable and there are multiple endings. Now, this is all I can say without spoiling, but I can tell you some, some episodes in the game which are uh, interesting without giving out a lot of this. Um, for instance, at the very beginning of the game, you could join a caravan of a society of... Uh, very special people. In that case, it looks like the beginning of the first chapter of the first chapter is uh, samey, 
you can you can do basically the same stuff but the second chapter is completely different when you arrive in crow's nest uh, there's an exploration the exploration plays with different location and it's rendered through different sets of cards and it's beautiful then you have the four the fourth chapter with a lot of special boss fights and uh, weird stuff uh, and that uh, can be modified by the items you collected uh, at the beginning of the game, by the choices uh, you did. This game does a, a great work at collecting stuff without uh, aggravating the cognitive load, load you, have, uh, you have to suffer through during the game. You basically have a list of items, they are shown only by name, you don't have to reference the entire card, and the game plays very smoothly and uh, very beautifully. I have to say, uh, since I'm uh, very attracted to nice mechanics, that I'm always impressed by how Greg Favreau manages to make complex mechanics and relatively complex stories very simple. You basically shuffle, you go through this deck of cards and you get different stories every time. I played uh, until the ending, uh, I think seven or eight times. I managed to get uh, five or six, depending, because the, the, the endings, because you lost, uh, are not really endings. I got five or six different endings and uh, each part of the story is uh, beautiful. Uh, that's basically it uh, as a stream of consciousness uh, way of talking about uh, Spars and Hildegard. I have a few considerations, but I wanted to know. Uh, I don't know, if, uh, I don't know, Alexis, but Fen, did you play it? Yes, I was able to play it exactly once because my copy arrived damaged. Oh. Um, so the it, it's a it's not a shipping issue. It's the cards for the entire first chapter and half of the second chapter were hit by a machine in the factory and were dented they shouldn't have ever gotten past oh. quality uh so all of the card box card backs are marked so because my brain picks up on details like that after one playthrough i already mm -hmm. knew like which cards i'd seen before on the backs and everything um so i like the dice mechanic I like the six different sides providing multiple different routes to construct uh, bullseyes and how like half circles are less valuable than full circles, but some enemies force you to take half circles because they they don't you, you can't pick other ones. They have like certain yeah. target numbers. So the way that it varies it varies how difficult the enemies are, but not in a way that you can immediately look at and see the probabilities. Instead, you're like, okay, this is a bit of a visual puzzle, and it's a nice way of changing dice. That's, like, my favourite mechanic is the dice mechanic and the two-player mechanic. Like, the way that the game tweaks a bit just to fit a second player in, it works really well. It's very enjoyable. Um, so that's all great. Artwork, fantastic. The player mat is 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 really good. I don't tell it. Yeah, oh, you're missing out. It, it comes automatically with room for how big the younger sister <laughs> so it's just everything there nicely organized with inventories and like the wildlife deck uh, story deck and a discard pile it tracks your sets and your bullseyes and has a nice play area in the middle and a ferret um so it's it's really well done i'm glad i got any it. any play mat is also automatically uh, enhanced by the appearance of a cute creature animal absolutely <laughs> absolutely um yeah so, like, in particular, that's the stuff I really liked. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say I'm not impressed by it being a bunch of cards. There's a couple of occasions where it being cards works in a different way to it being pages in a book. But mm -hmm. there's, like, this reminded me of the Steve Jackson and Ian Livingstone um, <laughs> fighting yeah. fantasy books. 
Uh, yeah. Admittedly, on the better end of them, because obviously the first few fighting fantasy books, which <laughs> you can get on app, you know, on Steam, which is how I've played them, they have like one route through and like very random and quite terrible, and the combat in fighting fantasy is garbage compared to Spire's End. But ultimately, by the end of it, I was like, now I have to put this deck back together into the right order, which is, um, it, it was a little bit of a challenge, especially like some of the cards get discarded outside of their chapters and it all gets a bit mixed up. Um, it's cute as a card, but I don't think there was any time that I thought that it being cards made it, uh, did anything that a book couldn't have done anyway. Like even when you're drawing randomly from one of three different cards, you could roll a dice and go to a random passage in a book for the same effect. Um, oh. So uh, there was some cute card mechanics. Uh, one of the boss fights in particular was um, very cool. Uh, yeah. The first one where like the, the, but again, I was like, okay, well this isn't, it's cute and it's interesting and it's fun. I wasn't expecting the deck to do this, but this is the kind of thing I'd have expected to happen in, in a book version. So, that's why I'm not sure if I want the the original Spire's End because <laughs> most of it is this deck of cards that you go through and it's cool. It's a bunch of different routes and everything like that. But it is just a new way of presenting a choose-your-own-adventure game, but the pages are all split apart. Uh, yes, uh, it's... Uh... It's true that modern choose your own, own adventure games. I, I think Napoleon of Crime or okay, you have to wait. There's the courier at the door. Yes, just a yeah. second. <laughs> we have to wait right before the end. But anyway, that's that's my ultimate point. Is is I it, the cards added a lot of fiddliness to me, um, and I'm not sure how much value they gained over it just being a nicely illustrated book however you know alexis if you enjoy choose your own adventures uh, it's a good yeah one. The, the game looks the game looks beautiful i really like the artwork mm -hmm. on it uh it kind of skipped me by but uh i might i might try it on tabletop simulator yeah. at some point i mean i have a bit of moment now just to say like i am having a bit of a pain getting the uh deck replaced um i contacted uh favreau games um, and gregory got in contact with me and initially he was like oh yeah sure no problem this is terrible it's damaged i'll send you out a new copy and then i was like okay what do you need to know and he was like okay did you get it from the store or the kickstarter i was like well it came via the kickstarter and um he, he was like oh okay well then you need to reach out to games quest to sort it out which is fair enough like if he's in america shipping a replacement deck across to sweden it's better to get it done from Games uh, Games Quest, but uh, I sent everything across to Games Quest and contacted them, and I haven't heard anything for like four days or something. And they were like, "Oh, we'll get back to you within twenty four hours," and that's not great. Like, I have a product I can't really play more than once, and so. It's hard for me to see it, give it another go and see if the cards really click to a point that I'm like, oh, you know, actually, I, I could, I, I'll revise my opinion. So I may have to come back to this in the future, but I don't, I don't know how long I'm going to be waiting to get this replacement deck of deck and a half of cards, which is a bit of a shame, really. I'll, um, I'll probably next week if I don't hear anything from Games Quest, I, I'll give them a prod and then. Maybe wait another week, and if I've still not heard anything, I'll I'll prod um, Gregory himself again and say, "Hey, look, I did what you said, and they're not responding. Can you make them at least acknowledge that I I need replacements?" Uh, so Back. it sucks. It sucks to have such a pretty game and then be stuck there like in limbo with regards to when I get a replacement. Oh. Uh, was it was it uh, was it the expected delivery? Yeah, I am now the proud owner of the biggest box in my collection. You're already, you're always the owner of that. You're now the proud yeah. recipient. Of yeah, but I have a new biggest box in my collection, which I didn't think it was possible after uh, Kingdom Death Monster. So... Kingdom Death Monster isn't even the biggest box in my collection, and Aeon Trespass Ooh. hasn't arrived yet. Yeah, what is <laughs> a bigger box? Deep Madness, uh, Descent 2nd Edition. Uh, oh. 
I mean, these these are including expansions, but yep. like there's yeah. a single box for them. I I I had the first edition. It wasn't as big, so I thought it. Was Sorry, the, the sec- first edition and second edition. Um, yeah, I've got a yeah. I've I've got a crate. I've got a treasure chest for my <laughs> descent um, to keep yeah. it all together. Yeah, probably cheap theory games. Uh, big boxes are also. Bigger. No, they tend to be about half the size of a Kingdom Death box. Yeah, they're half, they're actually Cloud Spy's right next to it. Yeah, they're half the size of a Kingdom Death box, but they uh, they weigh a lot. Uh, <laughs> but they have have very efficient packing. So like Cloud Spire has Cloud Spire and all the expansions in one box, which is nice. <laughs> hmm. um, anyway. Anyway, yes. So uh, I've just bemoaned to Alexis and the audience about my woes with the customer replacement for Spire's End, which is currently... The service has not been very good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and it's imp- Greg Gregory Favreau was fairly good um, with his responses, but since he's had to hand it off to Games Quest, there's been nothing. Yeah, he's a fan fellow actually. I- I'll talk about this uh, in the conclusion because I have a couple of things to say, especially compared to Spice to Sp- the original Spice Sand. But I wanted to say this about the Choose Your Own Adventure, adventure books. Uh, this game, at some points, in a couple of points, when you go to Crow's Nest and during the second chapter, if you go through uh, some decisions earlier, you have to explore. When you explore, you basically pe- take small parts of decks and put them in sequence separately, and you use them on a timed exploration to uh, go in different directions. And that part is actually quite fun and smart. And I think it's a thing that, uh, that that's really uh, added value for playing with cards instead of, of just uh, flipping uh, pages in a book. I have played that exact mechanic in a Choose Your Own Adventure book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I so, yeah, in... um, that's what I mean. It's like... It's doing some cute stuff, and there's benefits to it. But I really need to be able to play the game more than like once all the way through in order to determine whether the cards are worth the tear the the the, the tear down. Like yeah. once you're finished with the choose your adventure book, you close the page, you uh, remove your thumbs from where you marked previous the chapters to go back to in case you just drew a random mm-hmm. dead end, you die, no options. Um, and then you admire the cover because it was Robot Commando, the best <laughs> fighting fantasy book. I accept no substitutes, uh, apart from the big um, five-part series. Uh, Prophecy, I think it's called. Uh, anyway, um, so that's... I, I don't know, for me, if the cards and what they provide outweighs the teardown cost at the end, and I need to play it more times. And I'll yeah. cut, once I get replacement decks... Uh, I'll probably comment on it at some point during a catch-up just to say whether I remain thinking that this just should have been a book with, the, like, the dice mechanic's really good, though, yeah? Like, the di- I love the dice mechanic, that's... Yeah, that, that's also the fact that the original Aspire Sand was uh, very difficult, uh, mostly because of the randomness, uh, but uh, the game was very difficult, uh, in Hildegard, they managed to uh, alleviate this kind of difficulty by using feats of marksmanship, which can be used to give you positive statuses, which accumulate, basically they, are, they add up and uh, they make a lot of stuff possible and actually achievable. There are a lot of mini games. there's hunting, there's fishing, and... Uh, all in all, this game has a lot more than Spire Sand. It's three times bigger than Spire Sand in number of cards. Yeah. I wanted to briefly note, you never give me space when you're talking about a given mechanic. The, yeah, sorry. The, uh, the, the, uh, another thing I really liked is that the feats, uh, there are points where you suffer a game over, but the game says, actually, if you've got enough feats to spend, you don't have to suffer this game over. We can move on. So there's a nice price between do I spend some of my feats to get through this and achieve this particular thing or do I take the L and save them for maybe yet in a chance to deal with some consequences of bad failure later. I thought that was that was nice as well. 
Yeah, uh, uh, that said, the everything in this game, starting from part one uh, and going through chapter four, is difficult. It has a, a kind of right level of difficulty, and uh, here is one of my uh, conclusion comments, which is uh, this game has a progression, and uh, you are expected to stay within that progression. Uh, for instance, there's uh, a place where you have the chance of uh, upgrading your wild shot die. It is uh, very important that you succeed because the rest of the of the game will be uh, harder without it. Especially at the beginning, uh, if you uh, miss some occasions to upgrade your stuff, you will end up with uh, uh, less feats of marksmanship because you will probably use them to get the status, to avoid that hit, to, to basically uh, counterweight the bad luck you had. And uh, you have a couple of, uh, uh, of chances to catch up in second chapter, but by third chapter you cannot... Uh, you cannot recoup anymore if you are uh, if you if you lost uh, the the first couple of upgrades you are done <laughs> so that's my first complaint about the game you say that but surely what that means is the real spires and hildegard players the ones who can wear their crown with pride and wave the golden catapult around are the ones who complete the game with the basic dice yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> Pro probably the, the the true gamers will play with just the black well shot die and try to do everything in one set. But uh, uh, special challenges anyway. This is a thing to be wary, to be aware of, especially since Greg uh, wrote a lot of designers' diaries talking about this specific aspect, and uh, so it, it, it's kind of half achieved. It's easier than uh, original Spire Sand. It's not still completely accessible. I, li I, I like my to have a challenge, so this is as not to be necessarily a negative, but uh, but uh, it's uh, okay. Uh, the second thing I have to uh, comment is uh, actually a bit on the aesthetic, uh, uh, not exactly aesthetic, ma materials and assembly of the box. Because uh, uh, when you said that the your, your copy got damaged, I am actually not that surprised. Uh, because it happened... Uh, uh, Actually, I think the cardstock is a bit thinner than the original Spire Sand. It could also be the same, but uh, since original Spire Sand was made in black and white, you uh, could miss some damage on the cards. Here, uh, a bit because the cards are uh, smaller, they are lighter, the, they could actually get scratched easily. So uh, that's one thing. The other thing is that the box uh, is... Uh, I can understand who designed the insert, but uh, the, the insert is terrible. Because uh, you have... Uh, every time... Uh, since the cards are in order, you, you would not uh, uh, sleeve them. If you don't sleeve the cards, uh, when you grab with your fingers the decks from the box, there's always one card left on the bottom of the box by the way the insert is made so you have to go with your nail and try to not scratch the card which is agonizing yeah this is um something that's actually very easily fixed with design uh, when you're making card wells at the bottom you have a step so the exactly. deck will sit above the step and when you press down on one side the whole thing will tilt up so you can lift it out and if especially if it's a very deep deck which these are you can then reach even the bottom ones without having to like dig underneath with a nail which i mean some people don't even have nails you know um <laughs> But uh, it's, yeah, yeah. So that's a simple, simple thing. And it's just, if you're going to make a plastic insert, make it right. I'm never going to stop beating that drum because I hate plastic yeah. inserts. They need to be the best. Uh, I don't like um, 
how large the two wells on the side are. Like they just yeah, you just put all of the plastic cubes and dice in, and they kind of rattle around, or you put them into baggies, which is what they came in. And I'm like, well, what's the point in the wells if they're going into baggies? Why not just have one big well and just check everything in there? Yeah, um, the, 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 I it's a pretty that box. Yeah. Uh, and uh, of course the part about the cards I fixed by just using card bands uh, I, I just banded the card together with a card band so they so, so they, they won't run away and I when I pick one I pick all of them so that's it but it's uh, a shame that it wasn't accounted for it was do you do you mean a rubber band uh, not, or, but uh, not not with rubber, with card. Not, with ca- yeah. with oh, it's, okay, so you you bound them with a cardboard slip, which is the way yeah, a cardboard slip, yeah. Ju- just okay. to beat the plastic drum again, that's how cards should be coming from the factory, not yeah. shrink wrapped. They should be just in a, a, a with a paper band or a cardboard band around them, just holding them together. That's all you need, and you know that's another thing I am here to to fight for endlessly because I'm tired of. Having a big pile of shrink wrapped plastic. Yeah, and if we ever, if we will ever talk about food chain magnate, that will be my big positive plus about the game. It is exclusively wood and cardboard, and nothing comes inside the uh, plastic bags. No, uh, actually, I think the wooden tokens comes in come inside the plastic baggies, but the, the money and the stuff is. Uh, in car slips so it's beautiful because it uses no unnecessary plastic yeah uh, splotter are very good at that like they minimize waste as much as possible um because their games are expensive anyway so you don't want to have a load of extra okay. bits and pieces but yeah uh, that is i think the time for us to uh, to hang up our catapults yep. It's all we've got time for in this particular episode. So you can have one last roll of those lovely target dice. Um, <laughs> I've managed a circle, a dot, and a black um, half circle with a dot. So I'm, I'm not doing much with that. Got um, a miss. <laughs> yep, yep, it's a miss. I'm going to save my feet for after the podcast in case I fall over. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for listening to The Last Standee. You can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash the last standy or one word you can also catch these episodes on youtube where you can write comments that make your red uh, maybe not maybe yes let's see actually if you've got game able. recommendations yeah. yeah hell yeah hell yeah we'll read those yeah um um or you can subscribe on your preferred podcast app there's so many so it's farewell from alessio goodbye alexis yeah and myself. And um, remember that the, the second E in standee is for end. <laughs>